Welcome to the Mob Psycho 100 Q&A. Mob Psycho 100 has been on my radar for a while and it's been a really amazing experience. And my only gripe with it is that it was way too short. Like it just came and went. And the premise is so good and the characters are so amazing. Like I said in the finale, you know, I could watch a lot of seasons of it, but it seems like we only have season three and it might be a short season at that, but better to have loved and had love be short than to never have loved at all. And I really did love it, especially Mob. But yeah, let's just jump right into the questions. Excel Damage asks, what are your thoughts on Tsubomi in terms of what she represents for Mob and his personal goals and growth? Tsubomi is sort of bizarre. She's an interesting one. She's sort of weird. I don't really know what to think about her. I think at one point I, I referred to her as a potential alien. <laughs> Which, you know, when you're a kid in middle school, specifically a boy in middle school, crushes have alien-like properties and you can't fully understand them. And they seem out of your world, which seems to be the case for Mob as well. But more to your question, what does she represent for Mob? It's perfect, as many of the things are in the show, that this amazing kid with all these powers can do anything, you know, can take down the leader of this massive organization bent on world domination and destruction, but can't talk to his crush. And that is sort of his motivation, largely. I actually love it. I think it represents something I've been talking about a bit on the channel since way back, where I think one deceptive thing in shows is that it always starts or usually starts with a challenge kind of being laid at the hero's feet, where Gandalf comes, for example, and is like, Frodo, you need to take the ring to Mordor, or the droid showing up for Luke and Obi-Wan being there to guide him. I think I was sort of misled by that a little bit, or I misled myself because I was always kind of waiting for it. I was waiting for like this catalyst. One day there will be a clear path to my destiny and I'll know it when I see it and that will make me who I want to be. That will make me a hero in my own eyes and everything else is sort of a matter of biding my time and waiting for that to happen. And a really key realization for me was that that's not coming. Like no one is coming or probably won't happen. It's very unlikely. And so what does it mean? You know, what are these things actually in real life? And I think one really great way to find them is to find a challenge, you know, find an obstacle of personal difficulty or personal fear or desire. Even if it's really base, let's call it simple, animalistic desire or a material desire or whatever it is, anything like that that has emotional resonance is in itself a call to action. It's something to look at dead in the face. Inevitably, if there's something that involves fear or something that involves a tumultuous inner experience, it means there's something critical. There's a truth in there somewhere that is waiting to be discovered and it can be discovered through a journey. And it doesn't really matter what that thing is. I actually would say to relate myself to Mob, I've been motivated quite a bit by romance. Now, Mob also sort of already has the answer, I think. Like the trap in there is letting that be the end of the assessment. Thinking that the thing that launches you on the journey is the point in itself. It's not. The point is the journey and the realizations you uncover that you couldn't possibly uncover for yourself just sitting alone thinking. You sort of have to meet the world and the world will give you the lessons you need because it'll, it'll whittle you down. You know, there's sort of no hiding from reality if you engage with it enough. And so the point is just creating sufficient energy to get yourself on that journey where you're no longer hiding, where you're no longer hiding behind whatever worldview you've built for your own self-preservation or just through your upbringing that has yet to be examined and get it to a point where you are becoming a student of life and where you can't avoid the lessons of life because you're you're basically leaving it all on the table. You know, you're leaving yourself on the table. Subomi seems to be that for Mob, which is so excellent. I just love it because it's so human and I immediately connect with it and understand why it's terrifying. I understand why she's the last boss, so to speak, but I think the show already has the answer for what it means for him and it's not her, right? The answer is not her. It's, it's who he is. It's him. He's amazing. She also may, might be amazing, but that's not the point. The point is him finding out who he needs to be through this journey and that's how the show starts. It starts with him willingly accepting the journey. Like, this is what I want. I don't know how to get this. I don't know who I am in this. So I'm gonna explore it. I'm gonna join this body improvement club and work on my body. I'm gonna enter this marathon. I'm gonna reflect on what it means to be a person in relationships. I'm gonna become someone of value. So when he finally arrives at the point where it's a critical moment between him and Tsubomi, I suspect he'll actually be successful with her, but he doesn't have to be. He'll find so much more along the way. And I really like that as a model for life. I really like the model of not shying away from the things that kind of call us. The things sort of nag at me that I realize I want but feel powerless to get, those are, are often key areas for me to focus on. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that you can manufacture your own ticket to destiny, so to speak. You can find these things that you want or find these things that give you some kind of emotional reaction and use that as kind of a, a pointer. Or what is more often the case for me is finding things I really dislike and wanting to avoid them, wanting to figure out how to get out of cycles that I don't like or get out of positions I don't like and wanting them really desperately. That almost always reveals something really key for me, even though it requires a lot of pain and embarrassment and fear everything that mom is experiencing with Subomi. Also, which is better, opening one or opening two? I think they're both excellent. I prefer opening one. I get super hyped listening to it. And I also like the lyrical message of the song. In hindsight, I think it captures a lot of what the show is about and kind of lays it out really neatly and succinctly. You know, if everyone is not special, you can be what you want to be. It's like freeing yourself from labels, freeing yourself from 
stories you're telling yourself in order to keep yourself safe or make yourself feel better artificially and actually explore what it is you are in a real way. That's kind of Mob's mob story to me. Nick asks, how do you feel about Taro's personal growth throughout the show? Taro's the man. I didn't really think much of him at first, but I think he's a great example of the kind of person that's super talented and, and basically has everything they need if only they could get out of their own way. Because he's amazing. He's got so many great traits. He's an ultra badass. He's super powerful and talented. He's a good friend, eventually. He's engaged with his life. He fights for what he believes in, but he was held back by sort of an insecurity about who he was and what his actual value is value is. And Mob's gift was freeing him from that so that he wasn't so stuck trying to maintain an image he wanted to build for himself and instead could just be awesome. It's tough, you know, you sort of set yourself up for failure anytime you are trying desperately to fight the natural flow of things and fight the natural flow of who you are. You're probably going to lose in that case. And he wasn't the strongest. You know, that's a game that would be hard to keep up forever. But I think it becomes clear as a viewer that he doesn't have to be the strongest. His attributes as an esper are just one and maybe even a minor part of what makes him so cool. What makes him so cool for me is his backbone and his clear thinking in times of crises and his leadership. He really shines during the last couple episodes where he basically becomes the leader of the reformed claw members and leads them to victory against what up to that point is the most formidable enemy the show has seen. There's no baggage in it. You know, it's just he has a clear vision and he knows who he is and he is enjoying, in a sense, what he is. Or he doesn't have to waste any energy clinging to a fantasy that he wants to believe in. And that's a theme that I think is repeated through a lot of the characters. I think just from the beginning, he has a real wisdom because you can tell a lot about someone by how much utility and enjoyment they take out of finding people who are better than them. You know, if you're really that dedicated to boosting yourself up or finding identity through comparison, you will never allow for other people to come into your life in a positive way because they're a threat. They're a threat to the worldview you've built up for yourself. And to let go of that worldview means something like a, a death. You know, it's like a, a spiritual death. It's a personality death. You know, he resists. He fights mob and initially is trying really hard to stay number one and you can see how much it means to him, but ultimately turns it around pretty quickly and is able to take enjoyment out of having mob as a friend and doesn't see it as a threat to who he is, which I think is also great. You know, as I said in the reactions, I think a lot of time that kind of comparison is the refuge of people who are afraid of a challenge, you know, people who are afraid of honestly getting what they need without self-delusion. Comparison is really seductive, partly because it's easy, you know, it's easier than actually doing difficult work when you can just bring other people down mentally, but it's not satisfying. And I think it creates a lot of internal discord and the, the sooner that's reconciled, the better. So it felt real to me when he was able to reconcile that and then became that much cooler. I feel like that was reflected very, very well and was true to life. Under 10 asks, this is not about mob and more about the reactions in general. It's only recently you haven't been able to remember characters' names in the shows. Could you try to remember the names? Honestly, I've always had this problem. I think the reason why you feel I didn't have this issue with the other shows previously is, first of all, the cast of Last Airbender and Korra was a lot smaller. But also, it's not just names, it's often specifically Japanese names. Ed and Al is a little bit easier for me than Rengoku and... See, I'm drawing blanks here. It's not an act. I will say that much. But I understand a lot of people feel like me not remembering the names is a slight to the show and the characters. For what it's worth, it's it's not me disrespecting the show. I genuinely love the shows I'm watching and genuinely love the characters. It's just a lot of the time, there's just so many of them and they come so quickly and they're not on screen enough for it to really resonate with me. But I will keep this in mind. I will do my best. Chris Sharp asks, what are you hoping to see in Jujutsu Kaisen and Kaguya-sama? I'm always looking for the same thing, basically. I think my entry point into media in general and sort of a key turning point in the way I experience just about anything I consume is realizing that there's a very direct connection between entertainment and meaning. Just in general, I think if we have a mechanism for something, it's not an accident and it probably serves a very important purpose. So what is entertainment? You know, and for me, it seems that entertainment is some internal recognition that there's something valuable in there to extract. And so knowing that I can be a little bit more conscious of it and my goal becomes to take from it selfishly. You know, anything that can expand my understanding of the world, anything that can deepen my own resolve in key ways, anything that can add to my values or my strength, anything that gives me new perspective, inspiration, hope, even terrible ideas are great. I love terrible ideas because by having that reaction and then forming an opposition to it or, or forming a counter to it, I also have gotten something of real value. I've solidified myself. You know, you can learn just as much from things you like as from things you dislike. I think it's no accident that a lot of times the things that trigger me the most or get me to talk the most are the villain's outlooks because I can simultaneously feel the appeal of what they're saying, but also can intuit that there's something wrong, like something bugs me about it. And by allowing that to hit me and reflecting on it and figuring, figuring out exactly what is going on, I feel like I come away benefiting. So this is kind of a general answer, maybe too general for these shows, 
but that's just kind of how I feel. I want things that give me goodness, you know, that make me a better person, a more insightful person, a stronger person, more compassionate person. That I think is a, a really huge benefit, if not the biggest benefit of being able to watch characters on journeys is that you get to have a life, you, know, you get to have a whole life and the experience that life brings in a really short time and also to extremes that you might not experience. And my goal, generally speaking, when I can, I don't always succeed at this, but I would like to make it conscious. I want to make it articulated in a form where I can kind of file it away and have that as a card. I find myself reflecting on just about every show I've watched actually daily. It, like there's not a day that goes by where at least one thing doesn't come to mind from one of the shows I've watched. Lately, I've been living my life walking around telling myself to set my heart ablaze. You know what I mean? Anything like that would make it of real value. And then of course, there are a lot of things that would be a great bonus like humor and animation, music, all that good stuff. <laughs> on this note, one thing I've been thinking about a lot that I think is kind of a pattern for me is that I become more and more clear on the difference between source and signal. And what I mean by that is you watch a show, right? And the show deeply resonates with, with you and it stirs up all sorts of emotions. So the natural response, I think, is to love the show. And that's amazing. And I feel the same way. I also love these shows. But I think there's a little bit of a trap there in over-identifying with that too much because it's not really the show, right? The show is a, is a vehicle for something that is deeper and that thing is inside of us. And if it's resonating, that means it's real. Like they tap into something real probably about humanity that exists more as an abstract thing. And I think where people go from there is they go a little bit too deep into the media aspect of it. You know, they consume the media without taking that extra step of questioning why that media is, is so valuable and using it for utility. You know, I feel the same way about video games. I feel like I was drawn to video games for a whole bunch of different reasons. One of them being that I, I really loved RPGs as a kid and I was drawn to that feeling of traveling and exploration as I talked about in like one of the very first Avatar videos I did. But the mistake for me was thinking that the video games were the utility. And I have nothing wrong with games just like I have nothing wrong with TV or media in general, but it would have been a big mistake for me to have the wires crossed and think it's the video games themselves doing the, the work, doing the, the good stuff, and then just playing video games forever, if you get what I mean. At least for me, I feel like there has to be a part of it that's extracted and then lived. And I think I'm selfish in that way, which actually I think relates to the question about names. It's, it's sort of why I can be a little bit detached from the source material itself. Like I'm super selfish when it comes to this stuff. I, I'm like taking from it greedily. I want to become a better person. I want to reflect on life. I want to sharpen my ideas and my wit and my outlook and my strength and my values, you know? Hearing myself talk, I feel like this is coming across as a little bit too critical. That's not my goal. I don't mean to be judgmental at all. I hope I don't come across that way. To put it in terms of myself, I just really enjoy having an extra layer where I can take the show with me to a point where it even ceases to be about the show to a certain extent. It's just me. Sarah asks, if you had to imagine a detailed backstory of Reagan's childhood, what would you come up with? So initially I was thinking he had this really rough childhood. He'd been through some stuff, but there were a couple of things he alluded to that made it sound like he had a pretty comfortable childhood. I'm going to guess that he was a really ambitious kid, really precocious, very intelligent, imaginative, and ambitious, and perhaps had very doting parents is my guess. It feels like he wants to differentiate himself a little bit. And I can relate to that. I think we've actually even seen a little bit of that from his mom, right? His mom sending him these job emails, like, like, get yourself a real job. I could see it being a couple different things or a combination of things. It could be that his parents were distinguished themselves, but he wanted to be distinguished in his own way so that he knows it was actually him and not him resting on the laurels of his ancestry. Or it could be that he was praised a lot as a kid and developed sort of an attachment to that and had a chip on his shoulder as a result and maybe couldn't cut it in orthodox ways. I'm sort of projecting a little bit of, of myself here. It's tough, you know, because no one gets out unscathed. Even people who have it really good objectively have their baggage. I can imagine a situation situation where there was a lot of expectation on him, a lot of positive regard that for whatever reason wasn't satisfying to him. Maybe it felt empty or maybe he felt like it wasn't something that matched the image of who he wanted to be. Maybe he valued individuality. Maybe he wanted to stand out. And so that might explain partly why he always seems to take an unconventional path. He always seems to be a little bit of a maverick and also perhaps fitting with the theme of running away. That was one of the things that hit me in the moment where he was telling Mob it's okay to run. To me, it feels like Reagan is running from something himself. That kind of catches up to him a little bit in season two, but he seems to be motivated somewhat by fear. Fear of failure, which perhaps in his mind is conformity. Fear of judgment, perhaps. You know, a lot of times people who take unorthodox paths do so because they are in some way afraid to engage with the things people expect them to do because only then can they truly find out if they're worthy of all the praise they've gotten used to. It's hard to explain, but I feel like that was a mistake that I made where there was a lot of expectation on me to succeed in certain areas. And when I started struggling in those areas, I couldn't face it. I couldn't deal with it. And so I started finding ways out and a lot of the convenient escape routes were all things that gave me another story I could spin. Like, well, I'm, I'm just being adventurous, you know, I'm being unique 
or the conventional path is for suckers, right? And some of that was genuinely how I felt, but some of that was also fear. You know, it was fear of having to look this big challenge in the face and actually apply myself in ways everyone told me I, I, I could apply myself and kind of face that pressure and overcome it before I was ready. That was a very scattered answer. But to summarize, I would guess he doesn't have this traumatic backstory like you find in a lot of characters. He's just a very intelligent and somewhat deep person with an enhanced awareness of other people and of life who for some reason developed a chip on his shoulder that pushed him down an unorthodox path of no return. Mike West asks, have you ever had a friend bring you down from question mark, question mark, question mark, percent mode? Have you ever had to do it for a friend? I can't think of any incident where it happened to me right now, but a story comes to mind of a, a friend. We were really drunk and he made the mistake of urinating in the wrong place and it just turned into this whole thing. He was all revved up and he was starting to fight and I was trying to defuse the situation and I just couldn't. I could see it was escalating beyond a point of any return. And so I had no other option than to just like hoist him up over my shoulder and run off. Like I fled with him on my back and we lived in the same building and I sat him down and I'm like, dude, <laughs> you can't be doing that. Actually, I feel like I have a bunch of those stories that are similar. This also happened in Korea. There's this area in Seoul called Hongdae, which is one of the best spots for nightlife, which is filled with bars and clubs and restaurants. And sort of in the middle of it is this park where you can go and listen to live music and pregame. And it's just a really great way to like start your night or a place to go in between bars. And going there often, you end up developing these loose acquaintance acquaintanceships or friendships with people who also frequent the area. And one night, a Norwegian friend of mine was talking to a Swedish girl that we knew, and they were approached by a group of Korean guys. There was some jealousy involved, and I don't know how it started. I was not next to them. I was just sort of in the area, but they started brawling, and my friend got knocked out, and I also kind of picked him up to get him out of there, to get him out of danger before he got his ass kicked even more. And I took him to the bathroom to sort of like wash his face and recover. And one of the attackers followed us in and started attacking me while I was helping my friend. And like, I was not into fighting him. So I was basically just defending myself and like trying to block his punches and kicks while trying to calm him down. And he couldn't sustain his anger because I wasn't fighting back and he just left. Sambi asks, how do you determine when to show support versus when to be hard on people? I think generally speaking, more important than what you do or how you do it is what's behind it. I think if in your heart, you truly are looking out for the other person's best interest and there's no jealousy at all and there's no trying to impose your own values onto someone else because you're afraid of the alternative, then it's going to come across one way or the other. I mean, even if they don't get it right away, I have really good friends who take various approaches and the constant in me being able to hear them or me being able to appreciate it is where I feel it's coming from. I can get two totally different approaches from two different people and it means just as much to me just because I'm able to recognize where it comes from. Alternatively, I've had experiences where people showing me support felt bad, you know, because it felt empty or it felt like platitude. It didn't feel like they were listening to me. You know what I'm saying? So I wouldn't worry so much about the method, but about being honest and really, you know, having the person's best interest at heart. And if you don't, probably better to sort of take a step back. And that's a hard question to ask yourself. I mean, it's not always immediately obvious what your motivations are. Something to consider in this question is what is at stake for you? Because it's possible to love people while also letting them make their own choices. And then a secondary consideration I think would be what type of relationship you have with them and what you're willing to lose and what the dynamic is. Every relationship has a different dynamic and not all dynamics are totally pure. I feel like it's especially the case with romantic relationships where there's more of a need, there's more of a personal need. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just exists a lot. I think it sort of has to, you know, a relationship, a romantic relationship is a little bit more of, of an exchange or there's a little bit more of a threat. So promises are necessary and boundaries are necessary and give and take is necessary than let's say a friendly relationship. And in some cases, you just may not be in a position to be offering anything at all, if that makes sense. If it's the kind of friendship where you know in your heart that the other person is your real friend and is open-minded and is at the end of the day, they're for you and you have the same feelings for them, then you sort of can't go wrong, is my feeling on that. I would also say, and I apologize that this is just semantic nitpicking, that maybe the second option, being hard on people, would be better conceived as being honest with people. It's possible to be honest with a soft touch, if that makes sense. Okabe Bay asks, which of Reagan's special moves is your favorite? A thousand percent purifying salt. I will never look at salt the same. I will never doubt its critical role in both flavor and exorcism. Second favorite is just like the kick. <laughs> he just knee kicks people. Very direct. They're all great though. Oh yeah, Cheeseburger Tornado, man, that's a that's a good one. They're all great. Benji asks, no way out of this one. Rank the enemies you have finished on the channel. Oh, you gotta do this to me, huh? The difficulty I always have with these ranking questions, and again, this is gonna be sort of splitting hairs, but here we go, is the question of like ranking based on what? You know what I mean? Because there are so many 
different categories that might change my assessment. But I guess if I'm gonna do like a quick scan of all of those things and just answer instinctually, oh man, it's so hard. I'm sorry, I, I can't, I can't do it, it's too hard. I know this is an unsatisfying answer. I wanna answer in the same vein that you asked the question because that would probably be the most satisfying to hear, but I honestly can't. I can't rank them in terms of favorite because they all occupy a different spot and did different things really well. And I know that sounds like a cop-out. It's honestly how I feel. So like, for example, Attack on Titan was the most most meta show experience I've ever had in my entire life. Like, I couldn't believe at times how it was literally in real time calling out the very things that were happening in the discussion around the show and how aware of that it was. From season one, you know, do you know who the real enemy is? It's the audience, <laughs> it turns out. It's us, it's the inherent cruelty of life and what that does to us. And even now, after I feel like the show has played its hand pretty clearly, there are people who can't let go. You know, the people who really can't let go of some of the earlier notions that the show provided as premise to then later subvert. And the reason for that is it hit on something really important and really significant and very pervasive. Attack on Titan gets you at, at a gut level and perhaps goes deeper in that way than anything I've ever seen. And then I'll say the same thing about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, but in terms of hope, like how optimistic it made me feel, the level of connectedness it gave me to the universe and you know, articulating those ideas about, geez, I'm already forgetting the terms. All for one and one for all is my hair academia, but you know what I mean. And the goodness the characters possess, and also the ideas of they're not really being any negative things necessarily as it relates to humanity, but is more about how they're applied and how much you are separate from humanity and therefore separate from the universe. That's such a huge idea that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. My Hero Academia is my top show for inspiration. I think about that show all the time. Um, and plus ultra. Fruits Basket, I think, is the best show in terms of empathy and like just legit compassion and love for life and its elements and forgiveness and responsibility. Themes of responsibility in using one's pain and trauma as a vehicle for destiny and self-identity. To give you some answer in this question, I would definitely put To Your Eternity at the end of the list, just because I feel like it hasn't yet solidified its theme in a way that's as satisfying as the other shows, which is sort of unfair because most of these other ones are finished or are way farther along. And then Mob Psycho is one of the best looks at, how would I put it? self-actualization or avoiding traps, really common personality traps, how to have a healthy outlook. A lot of these comments are just show rankings. This really launched something. It's a good question that I couldn't answer. Queen Hudson asks, the Body Improvement Club was probably the biggest point where I realized how great the anime was. When did you realize the anime was among the most necessary pieces of fiction? <laughs> I think it was similar. That's the second episode, right? When he joins, pretty early on. I think when it dawned on me that he was a super powerful kid whose goal was to impress a girl, I was like, yes, this show is going places. This show is going real places. It's such a great way of having your cake and eating it too. You know, like it's anime, it's a shonen, right? And there's gonna be great action. But at the same time, that was one of the most real premises that I have ever experienced. <laughs> I saw this mentioned in a comment and I think it's very insightful. It's almost like what Mineta could have been. You know, I think I said that at some point during the My Hero Academia reactions where it's like, don't sleep on Mineta's backstory. It's one of the most powerful forces in the world. Maybe to a greater extent than people realize, or at the very least, just to a very large extent, people are motivated by finding suitable partners. And just about everyone who's lived knows the chaotic energy that it can create, especially when you're mom's age or, you know, high school. A lot of shows lean to the grandiose, you know, a tragic backstory, home life being totally disrupted, family members dying. And those work really well, primarily because if you want to establish strength and positive traits in a character, one really great way there is to provide challenge. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way to be compelling. Normal stuff in life works really well too. And I think offers a flavor that I really enjoy, partly because it's rare. I was just talking about this in an earlier question, right? We are sort of geared to expect the wise sage to show up with a journey. You know, you have to go do this go on this adventure, you're the chosen one. When actually that's often just a symbol for something more mundane in its way and common, which is just human struggle, human experience, and the destiny that that creates if you can identify it and focus on it. And so it's nice when shows actually do that. It's nice when shows have human people living their lives and trying to become who they are in society. And then the powers thing is sort of a separate thing, which the show is very aware of. That's one of the reasons why it's just a given that he has it. Another very important reason being the theme of not over-identifying with certain traits and using stories you tell yourself as a crutch to prevent yourself from having to develop. And then it just sort of got deeper from there, realizing how great Mob is as a kid, how pure he is, seeing the reflections on ego and identity, which have sort of always been a sacred idea to me, but I've never seen articulated so well. There's been a lot of shows that cover ideas of being special and fate and destiny. Mob, I think, has an extra layer of clarity on it. It's tough to pin down and tough to say what it is exactly, but 
I think Mob does a really great job solidifying what it isn't. And it's not what basically all the characters are doing except Mob. And Mob's influence is to free them from that, to ground them to something higher, which oftentimes is more terrifying. It involves letting go of the things that have been protecting them or the things that they've built their whole beings around in order to be temporarily vulnerable, in order to let in the right things so they can be better than they ever imagined and more strong and robust than they ever thought possible. That's such a beautiful and great metaphor for life. Simultaneously grandiose and relatable. And then, if that wasn't enough, it also happens to be funnier than it has any right to be. It's just hilarious. Like, I spent the whole reaction series cracking up. And it's a kind of sly humor too, which I really appreciate. And then also, rounding the whole thing out and making it just absolute perfection, is the fact that for a show so focused on human experience, let's call it, or human personality, it almost entirely avoids a lot of things that would be way too obvious and gives people a depth that you wouldn't expect. Even knowing that that was the case, I still found myself continuously surprised by the direction a lot of the characters took. Like a character is around and serves their purpose, but they're rarely gone and they're rarely gonna be that way forever. They're all growing. The whole cast is growing on, on sort of the same trajectory. So that was also really refreshing. Filio Art asks, has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you let things go unresolved until it reached a breaking point? Oh man. I think I've had a lot of experiences like this actually. I'll give you an example over the past couple years. When Corona hit, I sort of just dove into YouTube headfirst, and that's all I did, pretty much. Before that, I had been living abroad, and suddenly my prospects for that were canceled, and so for a little while I did that cliche of living in mom's basement, and just went full force video, and like had no social life, and no dating life, or any, of any sort, and it's kind of funny, my friend and I joke about this, but I broke that sequence of time by taking a trip to New York in between that and Korea. And I said to him in a conversation about romance and dating, I said, I'm gonna fall so hard for the next girl that I meet, and it's gonna be dangerous. That's exactly what happened. Things have stabilized a lot now, I'm happy to say, but man, I was so caught off guard by my girlfriend. I'm really into her still, but I think there was a part of it at the beginning that was a little bit unhealthy. It was years of denying a very critical aspect of my, of my humanity, not just romantically, but just socially. You know, I'm a very social person. I'm, I'm a very strong extrovert in terms of where I derive my energy. And that created a real need and a, a sort of deficiency that I feel I didn't have prior. And it made me kind of vulnerable and put me on my back foot. And it's taken a little while for me to kind of get my feet back under me. I would say another example is that I kind of let my ambition go unchecked for a long time. Speaking of kind of shying away from things and taking an unorthodox path, I started off my life with a lot of esteem for my family and friends and a lot of expectation, which came from the fact that as I think a lot of you know by now, I was in movies when I was a kid, I was a child actor. And so there was just so much hype built around me that I got attached to. And that career came to an end, sort of leaving me, leaving me with this vacuum. And my way of coping with that was to sort of shy away from anything that would make me have to come face to face with those expectations because they were terrifying. And I just chased loophole after loophole, which after you know a bunch of careers ended with me teaching in Asia, first in Korea, then in China. And that was really great in the sense that traveling did a lot for me, being out in the world did a lot for me, but there was an element of it that was unsatisfying because not that I have anything against teaching, I think it's a great career. It's not a good fit for me and it doesn't really match sort of my, my natural talents, I feel, and also what I see myself doing. But I wasn't able to fully come face to face with that or address it. It was sort of just bubbling up on the surface and came out in all sorts of weird ways. You know, like if you don't address that kind of thing, it still comes out. It just comes out in kind of redirected paths. So you just sense things are wrong and, and things are weird in your behaviors when you observe them. And why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? But in hindsight, I think a lot of that was connected to frustration, you know, frustration about what I wanted to do and where I saw myself being. The resolution of that, I think, was what led to YouTube. And it's not like, you know, I'm a massive success by YouTube standards, but it's definitely a level that I feel really good about. And as I've said in videos, I think there's a kind of level you can hit where if you're, if you feel really good about what you're doing, the comparative stuff doesn't really matter as much. And it's almost hard to imagine it being better, if that makes sense. Like there's a, there's a sort of binary sweetness that if you get that sweetness, that's, that's it. That's everything. And I feel that way a lot of the time doing this, but it, it took a lot. It took a lot of awkward movements, weird zigzagging to kind of get myself to a point where I could look at it and put myself in a position to actually be more authentic. And in terms of sudden positive emotions, speaking of which, I would say I never really imagined the utility that doing this would bring me. At so many levels, you know, career-wise, giving me the freedom to live abroad, which is amazing, but way more importantly, just my own personality and having the opportunity to, to articulate ideas in a way that's useful to me. I feel like I've grown a lot. It's tough because I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to over glorify what I do, but for me, there's something about this that's meditative. It's giving myself the opportunity to be in a detached space because the show is the backbone or the backboard, and I can bring things out that are kind of already there, but have not been solidified and solidify them. And then once they're in that state, I then have them in a more concrete way that I feel permeates my, just my essence of who I am and my personality and the way I think. But in general, I think I experience this a lot in moments. You know, I have moments where I just feel really clear and I feel connected in a way that's hard to explain. If this sounds crazy, it's 
because I am, but it at times feels like the universe itself is communicating with me, telling me that I'm exactly where I need to be and am who I should be, at least in that very particular moment. And it doesn't last that long typically, but I always appreciate it when it does. Just today I was reflecting on this with a friend about how, you know, we're kind of caught up in our respective things that we're doing. He also is on a path of his own that's really taking shape. And it can be easy to miss sometimes because the things you develop happen so gradually. But, you know, you take the time to look back and try to put yourself in a previous mind state and look at yourself now in that mind state. And so we were talking about that and I was filled with a real sense of gratitude that a lot of the things that I, I dreamed of have come true, even if they came true in a way I didn't necessarily imagine the details of, if that makes sense. Pi asks, if Bob had a Reagan-esque special move, what would it be? Seeds, purifying seeds, where he throws his <laughs> broccoli wages at you. <laughs> <laughs> and you're too embarrassed for him to keep fighting. Or maybe some kind of embarrassing haircut move, a la Teru. Filiard also asks a huge question. What do you think is the best way for someone to live fully to what their purpose is and how best do you go about honoring those you care about? Man, that's that's a big one. I feel somewhat unqualified to answer this just because I'm like currently in that journey, like everyone else. One thing that comes to mind is something contained in Mob, where acknowledging that there are choices, which might sound stupid and simple, but I actually feel is not as common as you might think. You know, there's something about realizing that that no help is coming, even though that sounds bleak. What I mean by that is the path isn't gonna walk itself. There has to be a decision made at some point that one's life is one's own responsibility. And that while there are of course circumstances that are outside of one's control, whatever those things are that are in our personal control must sort of be accounted for and taken responsibility for in a sort of responsibility maximalism. From there, I think a lot of questions rise organically because then it's a question of, well, if my life is in my own hands, what am I doing with it? I think one good way of conceptualizing it is first to try to take some of the pressure off because you can't fully envision it. I mean, maybe some people can, that hasn't been my experience. I, I don't know. I, I still don't really know the trajectory. For some people, the answer is just following cues, but one good way to perceptualize it from the beginning, I think, just as a, a launching point, like Mob with Subomi, is to look at it from two ends of, of the same spectrum. One is the positive. Like if you really allowed yourself to dream, really dream, like dream huge, as I often say, to the point where your palms start sweating. That's sort of the, my physical response to hitting that spot. What does that look like in terms of your you know, actions? What are you doing with your day to day? What are your values? You know, What kind of person are you? What are your relationships like? If you were sort of the perfect person in your own eyes, what does that look like? And then at the other end of the extreme, it's what is the opposite of that? You know, if you really were doing your worst, you know, if you gave into all of your, your worst instincts and vices, what would that look like? And does that scare you sufficiently to start taking action against it? Or just generally speaking, what do you dislike about your day-to-day -day life? One key thing for me, as I alluded to, was not really liking teaching. And before YouTube or any of that or any of those endeavors, that led to me wanting passive income and led to me starting a stock portfolio that has become really beneficial in my life now. It all arose as part of a question of how do I get out of this thing I really don't like? Not teaching necessarily, but more of like the, the whole nine to five thing. From there, I think you have something like a trajectory. There's gonna be something in there somewhere if you're really thinking about it honestly, that kind of pushes you out. And then I think the key is to be like Mob and stay humble with it and not get attached to anything, not look for false friends of identity where, oh, I, I did this, now I'm great, I'm done, you know? Or to start comparing away the difficulty, but to rather embrace it and sort of deal with the fear and the uncertainty and the anxiety and the embarrassment perhaps, the pain of failure and to kind of persevere through that and keep pushing on towards the things you've envisioned or away from the, the negative things you've envisioned. Like many things, I think one good just rule of thumb that I like at least is the perfect is the enemy of the good. So rather than have like my, this is my purpose, right? This is my destiny. This is exactly what I need to be. And this is the only path. It's more like, this is the best direction I have at the moment. And so I'm going to start down that path and that path will reveal how I really feel about it. And from there, you just, you pivot. You, know, you never go backwards. You can alter your course, but it's all for for trajectory. Figuring out things you hate is often just as valuable as finding something you really like. Finding out things that do not come naturally is also very valuable. For a long time, I thought I was lazy because there were things I identified as goals, but didn't feel moved to take action towards and kind of beat myself up about that a lot. Like what's wrong with you? But the truth of the matter was discipline can go a long way, but I feel stronger than discipline is just actual connect connection, finding something that you, you can't not do. Because if you have to force yourself to do something against your will, I feel like that only goes so far unless you're a really just naturally very disciplined kind of person, which is rare. And then about how to honor those you care about. My outlook on this, and I recognize this is not the only one or probably not even the best one, it's just sort of what I've come to on it, is something that might sound selfish, but it's to kind of solidify yourself as best as you can. The stronger you are, the more you actually can help people in a healthy way. And also the less people have to worry about you. If you're talking about honoring people who really care about you, good chance those people want you to be really happy and healthy and successful. And so you honor them by living well. And when you're in a position to do so, you can do the same thing for them or for other people as well. Tyler Sitter asks, other than Mob, which other character do you personally think had the most character development in the series and why? I'll give a dual answer. I really like Reagan's development, especially in those two 
to Reagan-centric episodes, it was really interesting seeing him fall into the same trap all the other characters fell into. You know, no one's immune. You can know something and still not know it on every level. Mob is a show largely about identity, and in his case, he was identifying with being like this leader figure, this great mentor figure, which of course was true, but was also a trap for him. The label is not what matters at all. It's the, the actual act of service or of giving. So I really enjoyed that. And I'll also say Ritsu. I think Ritsu had some of the greatest depth when it comes to that false friend of identity, as I've been calling it, because I know that feeling, you know, I know the feeling of having this one thing, this shiny thing that if I had that, everything would be okay. That's who I would be. That would clear away all my problems. But then sometimes getting it, sometimes not getting it, but either way, realizing that it's not that that thing isn't good. You don't want to sour grapes it and say, well, I didn't want that anyway, when you really did. It's more that the thing you identified as giving you what you wanted wasn't really what you wanted. It's just a mask that it wore. So basically all the things that we desire are probably going to be representative of a very few basic things. And I think the, the quicker we can identify what those things are, and they all will seem super obvious when you actually hit on it, the faster you can move towards it because you realize there are multiple paths in that direction. And you can use your in inborn talents and skills and aptitudes to achieve those things without kind of going against the grain or fighting reality and being something you're not. Turns out Ritsu actually has a lot of talent, but that's sort of not the point. The point is he was hiding something essential through his fixation on Mob's powers. That wasn't really what was important at the end of the day, and his realization of that was very satisfying. Michael Stollard asks, as someone graduating college who will most likely lose most of my friends, how does one go about making friends as an adult? Well, you mentioned these past two years being especially bad. I would take yourself off the hook for that somewhat. It's not really the most conducive climate to... <laughs> making friends or hasn't been, I would also let yourself off the hook a little bit about losing your friends. I don't think the things they'll go on to do, no matter how big they are, will necessarily be of any detriment to your relationship with them. But just on a practical level, a couple things come to mind. One is never underestimate the power of being a big fish in a small pond. Like if you can align socialization with something you're already doing and are good at, that will probably go a long way. One thing that comes to mind is social events and meetup type things. But honestly speaking, I feel like there needs to be some kind of glue for relationships to form authentically. And I think a lot of times that glue has to come from proximity. So if you can find a way to have an activity or just anything, even if it's work or whatever, where there are a regular group of people you see often and the goal is not necessarily to make friends because that puts some pressure on it and puts some strain on the, the formation of the, of the friendship. It will probably happen organically. A lot of my close relationships have been from school, unsurprisingly, because you're just in school together, right? You're not there to make friends necessarily, but you just spend a lot of time together and you find people who click with you. And then before you know it, you have a, a solid relationship that transcends the school. I've had the same thing with work. I've had a difficult time like going out to make friends. You know, that's sort of a weird way to frame it from the onset. So with that, I think an approach is to create a routine or maybe habits that allow you frequent exposure to large groups of people. And the more you can do that, the more you can create that space, the likelier it is that that'll happen really well. The Great Quack asks, thoughts on the whole Claw Squad from season one turning good in season two? I wouldn't say I had super strong feelings about all the members of Claw, or maybe any of them. What I really like about it though, is the fact that their arcs were not done. You know, that they could have just been minor villains that were destroyed and that would that's it, but that's not what Mob is about. Mob is about personal growth and change and that extends to everyone. No one has a monopoly on that. So I appreciate appreciate that that was a thing that happened with those characters. Like I said, it's in line with something I really liked about Dragon Ball Z, where in a lot of shows, the answer to your problem is, is to destroy the villain. You know, there's this great evil and you take him out. One of the things that makes that show so compelling to me is it's not about, or not always about, annihilating one's enemies and turning them into dust or whatever. It's about being so good and that goodness being so obviously right that the villains kind of defeat themselves. I mean, maybe that's more of a Dragon Ball thing than Dragon Ball Z, but at any rate, Goku beats them in fights, but the lasting effect of that is them sort of repeating Repenting and joining him, which to me is way more satisfying and is a victory on a, a kind of a cooler level than just like punching it out. To have that kind of sympathy for one's villains at all is a great thing. And it's nice because the villains represent the same thing we see in all the characters, except maybe to a, a larger degree, which is something that every human experiences, which is kind of the point. It's having an obstacle in life and overcoming it by something that will get you through it and will make you feel stronger, but is not the answer. Mob has a better outlook and having a better outlook, in my opinion, is not about like moral grandstanding. It's not about feeling superior. That would actually be contra contrary to the point. It's about long term, what actually gives gives you meaning, what actually works for not just you, but for the people around you, what is sustainable, what really feels good if you can get through the difficulty. And if something is real, if it's truly that answer and not just posturing or sort of empty moralism, then people who are looking will see that and they will understand it. They will have no choice but to see it and understand it, depending on how deep they are in their own ideologies. And so I think it was a really great move having not only Claw, but basically everyone fall 
fall into Bob's gravity. And it's convincing because Bob has that gravity. You know, it's not a lie. It's not because he's the protagonist in position, right? It's because he's undeniably really great. It's undeniably a strategy for life if you can stomach it, if you can stomach the pain. Tundra X Demon asks, who's your favorite antagonist Bob has fought? I don't think Bob actually fought him. I think Taro defeated him, but uh, the guy I called Gohan, the teleporting, can take no damage, can predict your movements guy. He was really fun. There's something about his energy that I really love. Speaking of Dragon Ball Z, but for people Bob fought directly, and I guess equivalent to that in terms of my feeling is the, I also forgot his name, the previous best Esper, the guy who got locked in the magic Pokeball, who took Mob on an inner journey. That was really fun. He also represented something I think is real, you know, a real sentiment even if it was kind of a, a blown up version of that sentiment. Musicism asks, if you could have one psychic power we've seen in the show, what would it be? It would be Mob's ability to make up powers on the fly. <laughs> Growing broccoli is underrated, I think. What's for dinner, honey? It's broccoli every night. The ability to predict movements, night eye style, is pretty damn cool. I'll pass on the plants, other cool powers. I really like Mob's powers of empathy, his psychic powers of empathy. I feel like that would be a really good tool, being able to kind of take other people's pain and give ideas through direct transfer. I feel like I would make really good use of that. When he asks, Every antagonist in the series has been extremely difficult. Which one would you have the most difficulty with? How much further do you see the show escalating the stakes? How do you hope Mob's philosophies develop in the remaining material? I would definitely have the most trouble with the final boss, and it's more than just his power. I think there's a part of myself that hasn't resolved some of the things that Mob has resolved. I'm not sure that I wouldn't choose darkness in certain scenarios. In fact, I'm pretty sure I would. I think, sad to say, one of the biggest things keeping me from a life of darkness is I don't have the outlet. You know, I'm not above crime. I mean, I have weaknesses, you know, and if you put me in a position where I could have all my wishes fulfilled and I had to make compromises as a result, I'm not sure I had the strength not to make those compromises if I'm being fully honest. In fact, I've proven to myself that I'm capable of making those compromises sad to say. Now that has benefit, right? Like I know that about myself, so I can hopefully be a little bit more vigilant, but I don't know if world rule is on the table, maybe my ego gets to me, you know, maybe I, I side with him, maybe I'm his ally or actually more likely I think is I'm not sure I wouldn't be threatened by him and his power and his ideology so much so that I, I would not be able to let go in the way Mob lets go and has sympathy. I think he would probably rile me up emotionally. There would be some kind of existential threat he carried for me that would not let me be as generous and self-sacrificial, which is what leads to Mob's victory. And as far as the stakes, it's really interesting because we still have the highest stake, the thing of the most danger ahead of us, which is Mob asking out Subomi. There's nothing of higher stakes than that. It's gotta go there, right? Like we have to get there at some point and it's gonna be glorious. And about how he develops his philosophies, he's learned how to see and sympathize and love other people. What's left, I think, is for him to give himself fully that same thing. That I think would complete his journey because he started off kind of being insecure and doubting himself. And man, who am I in the face of beautiful women? Who am I in the face of society? I'm just this scrawny kid who everyone thinks is a fifth grader. I'm nothing. I'm not special. But I think there's a way to be special without it being a trap. And I think it's the kind of specialness that is not comparative. It's just self-value. A test of that would be that no one else's greatness threatens your greatness. Mob can have that. And you see that sort of developing. He's gained a lot of confidence over the, the two seasons where he can speak his mind and he can fight and he's not this quiet, timid little kid. There's an extra step I feel like could go. You know, there's a, another level of that where he's just totally in unison with himself, has no wasted space about whether or not he's worthy or fits in. He does, you know, or he can on his own terms. And it doesn't have to be one of the many traps we see the characters falling into. And I think when he hits that point, only then is he ready for Subomi, <laughs> the ultimate boss. Because then he can approach it wholeheartedly without it being a risk to himself. It's just, he's expressing himself honestly and he'll be great either way, which is a really powerful place to do anything. Keegan Brackage asks, do you think it's Mob's bull cut that is conducive to him being such a good person? Well, I think that's so so obvious it doesn't even bear answering. <laughs> of course, I think the answer is clear. You know, you cut your hair like Mob and uh, you get all of his powers. Although weirdly, you see he's sort of losing the haircut. He has a Super Saiyan mode kind of where he, he gets a little bit spiky and he looks a little bit more badass. But I think there is a connection perhaps thematically maybe between his humility and his sort of average run of the mill <laughs> kind of cut by numbers haircut. It's probably not the hair that does it, but his hair is a symptom of the thing that does it. It's his unassuming nature and his lack of pretense that probably led to the haircut. <laughs> it's a sign of who he is rather than actually who he is. So that is all the questions for the mob Q&A. Thank you to everybody who asked questions. This was a lot of fun. It's been a, a long time it feels since I did a Q&A like this. There will be another one coming soon for Demon Slayer and let's not totally despair because there's still the mob OVA and of course season three which I hear is coming out this year if we're lucky. So this is not the end of the journey and maybe we can do another Q&A after season three.